So I want to start off with basically telling you what my work is about right now. Basically, my work is about painting in the moment and working with this, the response to color, light, and movement of the landscape. And this, for me, is a very, it's a, painting is a, a helpful way of engaging in, in the present moment and my interaction with the landscape. And it's, it's an interesting thing that has happened over the years of transitioning from studio painting to plein air painting. And you're, you are forced to work with the elements. Those of you who are painters or have painted outside, you have to work with that. And there's a certain magic in that in that process of engaging with, with painting. It's, you can't really pinpoint how a painting is made, just like you can't pinpoint how, when a, a seed becomes a flower. You can't really pinpoint that. And to me, that is a very interesting place to sort of, to hang out in and explore, etc. It's, um, because you can't pinpoint it, there's this magical quality to it. So what I'd like to do this, this evening is sort of break my talk into a few different sections. Sort of where I came from in terms of painting, and where I am now, and where I think I'd like to go. And also put a little bit of historical context into where I think my paintings fit in the, the lineage of, of painters uh, in, in the past. And then I'll put it up to some questions, some questions about the work. And then so in the past, as I suggested, my work has been about more studio practice, and it's gone back and forth between abstraction and realism, and it has, at times I was painting in watercolor, and I was painting in acrylic, and I made a transition into oil over the last oh, four, four years or so. And I've also made a transition from studio painting to plein air painting. And right now I split my time sort of evenly between the two, painting outside. And for those of you who don't know the term plein air, um, we have someone who speaks fluent French in here from France who could probably elucidate on that. But it just means in, in the air, I believe, open air painting and sort of on site painting. So the studio practice that I did before with watercolor and acrylic, I was, things were much flatter and more graphic, and there was a bit of abstraction going on, as there is now in, in certain paintings. And so I made the transition for a few reasons. Painting plein air with acrylic was very difficult. You have sunlight, you have wind, you have the elements, and your paint dries very, very quickly. So it wasn't uh, very conducive to a fast response to what was happening. And it, when it was drying quickly, it was very frustrating. So what I ended up doing is making this transition to, to oil. And there's also a cachet in terms of, there's a hierarchy, I think, which is uh, whether it's right or not, oil painting is supposed to be on the top, and then acrylic, and then water but that's, that's an arbitrary thing. Um, but one of the things I was interested in with the, with the oils, it connected to watercolor for me in the sense that there's this certain freshness and aliveness that you can get with oil as well as with watercolor and then I couldn't get with a cloak out in the field. So I made that transition and I started exploring with with the oils, and it's been a lot of fun. And I started bringing in a lot of the techniques that I used with the sort of the three things that I'm interested in in terms of where I am now in the painting process is sort of the, the, the subject. I have to connect to the subject, and as I said earlier, I'm interested in color, light, and movement. So if something strikes me as I'm going down the road or a place that I've been hiding. There's a certain moment that is very compelling to me, and I want to paint that. Um, so there's there there's that initial aspect. So I could use an example of these two pieces over here, um, the left side glaciers and then glacial moment. There's a 
favorite spot that I hike out on, um, on Mount Desert Island in Acadia National Park called the Valley Trail, which is, some of you may have hiked it before, and it's um, Beach Mountain. So it's this beautiful trail, and I've been there many, many times, and this was the first time that I had brought my, my gear. And my gear consisted of a backpack with a, a plein air easel, my paint, and my brushes, and all that stuff. So I was walking along, and I had noticed the, the rocks and the light and so forth. And I decided, well, I wasn't going to paint it right then. I was going to wait until the sun had come around a little bit more. And so I hiked around and came back. And I wanted to capture, so to speak, that that's sort of the essence of what was happening there, the light changing and the movement. So my work these days has had a lot more movement in it, brush strokes. I'm throwing paint on the canvas, as you may have seen when you look closer at some of the bigger paintings. So I'm throwing paint, I'm using large brushes, I'm using a lot of medium, and it's, it's a really kind of juicy experience with the, with the paint. Um, it's a lot of fun. And so one of the challenges these days with doing a, a plein air piece, like a smaller one, is to then take that, which took a fairly short amount of time to paint, because I wanted to be paint those several moments that, was, that were happening then and there. But then to translate that to a larger 30 by 40 inch canvas has its challenges. So part of that the process for me is to set that small painting up next to the easel and then any photographs that I may have had that I may have taken in that process. So these days um, I've been using technology to paint from and also you know, photograph something like this, uh, or not. Um, but it's fun to, to take that and then later on paint from it. So the challenge here was maintaining the same palette, maintaining the same freshness, which is a very hard thing to do from photographs, generally speaking. People, oftentimes the students that I teach get caught with the photograph. They want it to be just like the photograph and it becomes dead very, very quickly. So for me, what I want to do is I pre-mix the entire palette so I have all the colors laid out and enough of them so I don't get caught without color. And then I start painting. And it's, there again, it's another, this is where painting in the moment comes in there. I am now reacting to the larger piece, and I'm not reacting to what I was painting from out in nature. So it becomes a process of reacting to the piece, and to, it, it's just like, for example, when I was painting in uh, watercolors years ago, and those of you that have painted, as soon as you put a mark down, you've, you've, made, you've had this white, white canvas, and you've made a mark, and then you're reacting to that mark. And with watercolor, once you put a mark down, it's not coming off. So you're reacting to that as you're going along. And I'm taking that experience of watercolor and bringing it to the oil paintings and trying to maintain that freshness and aliveness of that present, of that experience that I was having. So the other, the other thing that I've talked about a little bit in our the formal aspects are for, pain for, me to work, for the pain to work for me, it has to have a few things happening. It has to have that freshness that I was talking about. It has to have a good design, in my estimation, good formal elements. And then it has to have Basically, those three things: the subject that I've connected to, the formal aspects, and the freshness. For all, if all three of those things come together, then I deem it a good, a good piece. The other thing that I'm interested in 
over these last few years since the, the Helicar and the Hogan Foundation is um, working with a little bit of a narrative, working, bringing the figure in. And so for me, the, the audience is becoming a little bit more, it always has been important, but what, what am I trying to say with the figures? What am I trying to communicate? And there's this, there's these other things that, that are sort of in the back of my mind. Where, how does the painting read for me? Um, does it formally work? And the other thing that has been happening in my work has been, where am I sitting in the, the lineage of painters? And trying to create, um, on occasion, pieces that speak to that, to that lineage a little bit. Um, for me, it's been an example has been this, this piece and this piece. This one being um, a photograph that Carl Little took and posted on Facebook. And some of you may know Carl Little, he's written many books, art historian, author, and so forth. He posted it on Facebook, and I instantly thought, any guesses? I don't know if I know. Sure. <laughs> Mond Mondrian. So I looked at these patterns, and I thought, that's Mondrian's ice machine. And sitting on, on out on the ice, and if he had one, that would have been his. Um, so I instantly uh, emailed Carl and said, "Okay, can I can I choose your picture for for a painting?" Um, so there's a little bit of that having fun with it, and the next this other one was painting painted around the same time, and I started looking at this artist named um, Malevich, and he is a supremacist. Um, so he has these very graphic design paintings, and I thought it would be fun. I like, well, that could be one of the nice fishing checks, so I put that one together. So I've been having fun with, with that as well. So in terms of where I think I might be in the, the lineage, of, or where I think I, I come from, um, I grew up fear to reporter, and uh, Edward Hopper. Um, the ones that I look to in terms of inspiration, especially the Fairfield Porter has been a big influence these days, I think in terms of my philosophy of, of painting. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a quote I just read, it was in the Plein Air magazine. It's, I read it, it's like, wow, that's, that's, that's where I'm at. So this is a, a bit of a quote, um, as I said. So in, in 1968, Fairfield Porter was interviewed by Paul Cummings, then the adjunct curator drawing at the Whitney Museum of American Art. And Cummings posed the question, do you think that a painting is more of an emotional expression than an intellectual one? Porter responded, no. I don't think it's more emotion or more intellectual. I think it is a way of making a connection between ourselves and everything. You connect yourself to everything, and that includes yourself by the process of painting. And the person who looks at it gets it vicariously. If you follow music, you vicariously live the composer's efforts. So to me, I was like, that sort of gave me goosebumps when I read it, because it, it fit. It fit with uh, where I thought I was, and and and, and it, in terms of the work. So there's, as I was saying earlier, there's this process of me painting, and then this process of you interacting with the painting. And um, it's an interesting, interesting thing, I think. So. so one of the other things I'd like to say about the, the process of painting is to give you an idea of how, how it piece work. I gave you an idea of how a plein air piece works, going out and finding a place to paint in response to some color, some movement, some light, something that's been, that strikes me, sort of a feeling. Um, in terms of the, the, the nitty gritty of the painting, I will take a, a panel, and most of these are painted on, on panels. And if some of you have looked closely, you can see that there's this color that's coming through in some of the paintings. Uh, especially 
actually in this piece up here, the larger one, of the figures on the dock. You can notice that there are this sort of orangey color that's coming through. And what I've done is I've toned the canvas or the panel with a certain color. It isn't actually orange, it appears to be orange by the colors what they get put on there. But what that does for me is it creates this, this they call it a brown, and it's been used for many, many, many years by many artists for lots of different reasons. And so what that does for me is it creates more of a, a color to react with as I put the, the paint down on the canvas. And it's something to work off of. So, for example, if you were to go home, if you're not, not a painter, but you have cans of paint at home, and you were to paint a wall gray first, and then you put your color on it, it's going to do a certain thing, versus that color on the white wall. So, when I'm painting on a white canvas, there's something that is not quite as exciting to me as having this color that's there. And oftentimes it's a warm, it's a warm tone that happens. So, so there's that formal aspect. Then I start to, to draw in after I've done a, a sketch. And there's a little slideshow in the back. So at some point, you can see some of the sketches that I've done. I've put some plein air, shots of me painting plein air, and also uh, the process by which I'm painting. So there's a sketch that's done, and then it gets transferred to the canvas. And from there, you know, the painting, painting begins by blocking in larger areas and then getting to uh, smaller areas. And what I tend to do in, in the process is step back a lot from the painting and to get perspective. How, how is it working? Is it still fresh? Is it still alive? And one of those reasons for doing that is so I don't... so the painting doesn't get stale. That I don't get too caught in the little bits of things. So, there are some other artists that I think I sort of fit with these days that are, I think, painting in a similar, similar way. Um, folks like um, Colin Page and uh, Tom Curry and Connie Hayes are some examples of folks that I think are similar. And some other folks that in the past, I was saying that sort of historical context, Paul Cezanne and has been a big influence in terms of his work. As I said earlier, Griffin Porter and the Group of Seven from Canada. Some of you may know those painters. They're an amazing group. If you have a chance, look them up. Uh, they're a big, huge force in Canada, especially uh, Tom Thompson. So I think what I'd like to do now is uh, open it up to some questions. If you have any questions about, about the work. What color is your body of that? How do you do it? Do you Yes, sir. Do you Yes. What color is your body Well, oftentimes I like either early morning or late afternoon. And in terms of painting, the light changes dramatically. During midday, things kind of flatten out in terms of light. So the other thing that happens is the light changes very, very quickly. And I happen to be in Winter Harbor at the time in some painting. And I went down to the dock. And what was caught my eye were the, the light hitting the, basically the patterns that were happening of the light in the dark, um, as well as the, the little shots of green coming across. And that plus the color patterns that were happening and the color that was reflecting down into the line. So it's, it were those very, very simple things for me. And in terms of the luminosity, what I've learned over the years, I used to paint, as I suggested earlier, that I was painting more graphically and more in the style of the fathers, where you're just using a lot of bright colors all over the place. And I've been learning from some other painters and learning the past and present painters in terms of changing my palette and using some more earth tones. And in that 
process, when you put a bright color against a dull color, it appears really bright. Um, so if you have a gray against a, um, a very bright orange, it appears more intensely orange. And the same thing happens if you take opposite colors against one another. So, um, for example, a good example of that would be the, the ruby glow, which is the tanker. Mm -hmm. And what caught my eye on that one was I was down in Portland and visiting some friends and coming down India Street, and that tanker just popped from, from there. And like an hour earlier, I had been there, and it wasn't like that. What had happened was the, the sky color got deeper and more blue, and the sun hitting the tanker, it got more orange and red. And because that orange and that red are, are more opposites, that orange is closer to an opposite of blue on the color wheel, it pops. So tonight, as you, as you leave and you look at the, the sky color, it's bluer and bluer, and you look at a building with the sun hitting it, it appears much more intense. So it's, it's using color and value at the same time. The good plein air painters, they, they have this they have the preparation. So you've done, you, you're at the spot, I do a quick little thumbnail sketch, and maybe I'll take a photograph of that initial <coughs> thing that caught me. And that sketch, I lay out the, the value structure of the sketch, and I lay out all the colors, so it'll be a lot of Usually these days I've been doing a limited palette, which has been a narrow range of colors. And I lay those all out in a, in a quantity that's quantity not going to run out on me. And I start with a large brush and paint as much as I can with that large brush. It's probably like an inch and a half wide brush, um, even on a painting that's 8 by 10. And, um, Paint very quickly, lay, lay from the mid tones, dark areas, and then the light areas. And as it's going along, as you're suggesting, it's, it's moment by moment. It's not like one. Uh, photog photography is sort of giving you one point of moment. With painting, I think, in plein air, it's, it's, it's a whole process. So you're, you're, it's all these moments together, so to speak. <laughs> yes. The two paintings that speak to me are the two dock scenes. Yes. Mainly because they have people in them. Yep. Uh, what were you trying to cap what interaction were you trying to capture in those? Yeah. For me, while I was out, these happened like while I was out on uh, Great Cranberry Island at the Helicopter Open Foundation. So when I was out there I was struck by the, the community, this sort of this tight knit community of families. And when I was out on the dock one very hot day in August, I guess, I started taking photographs of these kids playing on the dock. And to me, it was just compelling because all these kids coming together, having fun, and, and so forth. I, that it was these, I took probably a hundred or so photographs and then went through and called to them. And they are, I did very little moving around with the figures in terms of, they're very close to what I took in terms of the photograph. So you finished it mostly in the studio, the people part? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I did paint on site these, you know, I did the entire painting in the, in the studio. I did some pencil sketches. The pieces I did out there were, didn't have people unless I had a model or two that came into the studio. Yes. Uh, these days it's uh, Raymar panels. They're a, it's a thin panel that has linen mounted on it. And how long did it take you to kind of establish that? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't know if it's established now. <laughs> uh, many years. Yeah, I just I went to school, graduated from college in 90, and have been painting ever since, and just slowly. It's a very long process. It's a very rare that someone can, uh, can be someone like um, Andrew Wyeth that has, has a show at 21 or whatever it was.
Royals and sells out New York City. That's a very rare thing. Um, you have to just keep building and working and working and making connections and finding places. Uh, <laughs> I do, yeah, yeah. I, in the sense of letting one sit for a while and then coming back. Sometimes, as I was saying, those sort of three aspects of just coming together, sometimes they happen so easily that it's almost as if the painting paints itself. You know, it's sort of like I was saying, it's hard to pinpoint how the painting is made because there's paint, there's me, there's the canvas, and you know, all these influence. Um, sometimes it just happens it just happens. <laughs> Other times it's a slog. Yeah. Do you help us to conceive of your end result? I mean, how do you know where it's finished? Um, part of it was those three elements that I was talking about. If it has, a, if the design elements are there, if the it has a certain freshness to it, then I feel like I'm. I'm finished with it. And there's a lot of times where I'm, I'm going back and forth in front, of, in front of the painting, stepping back from it. So, you know, when I'm painting, you know, I'm up here, so there's a different a visual relationship when you're this close to the painting versus, you know, being back here. Different things, things happen. Um, and also using a, a technique of sort of squinting your eyes. When you, when you all, if you squint your eyes, you're you see the big old shapes of the piece versus the details. And, and also by default, you know, stepping back to see the details. You said uh, earlier when you decided where you were in the industry, the reaction of the viewer is important in the painting. This is a painting. But that, we all see it painting differently. Yeah. It's a very decorative thing, yeah. um, an unknown thing, perhaps. Yeah. Do you try to understand that with your painting, or do you just assume it's happening out there and that's enough? People are reacting to it and however they're reacting to it. Yeah, I'm not sure if the, the reaction, uh, I, I think by extension, my if I'm reacting and excited about the work, then I feel somebody out there is going to have some similar kind of experience. So it, it's a bit like, um, um, I think this, this name. Now, Joseph Campbell, who said, follow your bliss, and you know, do, what it, do what excites you. And if, if the pain is interesting to me, it's something that's I feel by, by extension, the, the audience is going to have some kind of reaction as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense? I'm not necessarily wanting to, but I, I mean, I do. I do have conversations with collectors asking, well, what, what's, what do you like about that? What, what was interesting? Because it is interesting. As you say, everybody's going to have a different reaction. We don't all see the same colors the same way. Um, you know, somebody might be colorful or have different things, like things that have figures in them. Somebody else may have a different connotation of what that figure painting is about. Like last year, um, in the solo show, there was another piece that was similar to that. One of the collectors had created this whole narrative that I had not put in there. Or I didn't intentionally put in there. It's like, well, this young woman, she's coming of age, and you know, this and that. And that wasn't my intention at all. But it, sort of, it, it was part of, the, part of her reaction. It was interesting because she had this, she was, I think she was in psychotherapy or something. But yeah, she was, <laughs>
there is this the, the local color of that sort of yellowy green that was that was happening, that lemony color. But I intensified it a little bit to make it work, and then I decreased the intensity of, of the water and the, um, the landscape as well to make it work for me. And that's intuitive for you. Yeah, I, well, it's it's from practice, and it also some becomes intuitive as well. And it, also, it's it's looking at other artists, looking at how other artists treat that. You know, how they work will take a color, and then you know, once you put something down, everything else is going to relate to that. So if I intensify that lemony color, if I wanted to make it more intense, I needed to to dull the blue a little bit and make it and move it towards blue. So it, it popped more. So it's it's this it's a really a dance of going back and forth. You put one color down and it reacts. You know, if you're putting them side by side, they react in different ways. Yes. Could you talk about the car The car animated that hunk of steel into something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it really is like steel. Thanks. Well, it, part of this sort of thing that it sort of caught the things that catch my eye. I, I live in Sullivan, and I go down Route One and go by Merchants Auto all the time. It's sort of the uh, the saviors of people who have <laughs> broken down cars. Um, and then there's this other place called Piper's Auto Body, and they have all these. They're working on cars all the time, and they have these little jalopies that are out there. And I was going by one day. It was again. It was late in the afternoon. And this, I guess it's a Chevy, somebody can call me on this. 56. 56, was that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it's But I knew I liked the blue. So, and it was just, it was, it was just popping off of that sort of dark green area. And part of what I've been looking at in terms of, there's, when you look really closely at, you know, at, at first glance, you may not see this stuff, but once you start to look at something, there's all this reflected color of, of the green coming up into the chrome bumper and then off to the side. And that's what, for me, makes this a successful piece, is unifying that, those colors. So if this was all just blue without those kind of um, reflections, it would stand out very differently. So that's part of the end, sort of the animation process of making something feel more alive. Um, that plus using different brush strokes in the sense of, um, like I said earlier, I've been throwing paint on the canvas. So taking it, using the paint in terms of the direction of the brush stroke, as well as um, you know when it's there's I don't know what it is about oil paint when you go horizontally it does something and when you go vertically something different. There's something by the way, the way the light hits the canvas, the paint, it, there's something different that happens. So it's actually playing with those facets. Um, if you look at Cezanne's paintings, you see that he's, he's done that with um, faceting, like the oranges and the apples, or um, with the mountains that he's, he's painted. Yes. Yeah, you keep talking about your limited palette. When you yep. go schlepping off in the woods with the backpack, what yep. do you carry for paint? Oh, what do I carry? Yeah. Um, I carry probably like extra the extra tubes. Uh, let's see, I'll just go right through my palette. There's white. There's uh, cadmium lemon. Uh, cadmium medium deep yellow ochre. Um, and then a couple blues, ultramarine blue, and manganese blue, and then meridian, and then one other earth tone. Blacks? No, nope, no blacks. I make my own black. I take the meridian, um, there's a lizard and crimson in there too. I take the meridian, a lizard and crimson, and then ultramarine. And it's almost I... neo -Bolivers. What's that? It's almost neo -Bolivers. Oh, is it his palette? So yeah, I, the, I tried the black for a while, I think of the Soros, his, his palette, um, and 
I, I didn't like that I couldn't, I wanted to be able to mix my own black in the sense that if I wanted it warmer, you know, towards the ultramarine, I mean, I'm sorry, towards the alizarin, if I wanted it warmer, or more purpley black, if I wanted more green black, or whatever, to fit. Um, in the case of, like, say, this piece, and then the bigger one over there, um, um, the greens in there, I was, I was shifting around the, the darks. So moving the green towards the uh, blue and moving it towards the red. So it's kind of using that as a, as a default black. How do I throw paint? Yeah, like is it it's a lot of fun. Very... <laughs> does it I have take, a lot of medium in it? It does, it does. Um, I take one of the larger brushes and I um, load it up with a lot of medium and basically till it's almost sopping off the brush and just throw it in the direction that I want it to go. Um, so for example, this this is the most recent piece, the, the bigger piece from it's from the uh, top of Cadillac. And you can see some of the vertical um, bits of paint that I threw, you can see up in the sky. And so because I knew I was going to paint some vertical strokes up there and I wanted to create some movement in that direction, that's how I did it. And then on the box, I sort of took it and like, threw it, throw it that way. So with creating this horizontal or diagonal. And sometimes the pieces would, um, or the, the splatter, so to speak, would get painted over. Other times, they, I would leave them, depending if I thought it worked. And it's a tricky kind of thing because I don't want it to be too, you know, uh, what's that? You don't want to become Jackson Pollock? No, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want it to be too kitschy or, or what have you. It's a tricky kind of thing. Um, so I want it to serve the painting and, and make it work. Um, well, it certainly does. Thank you. And, you know, some of that, again, comes from the watercolor experience of, you know, there's a lot of that. Like, if you look at Andrew Wyatt's watercolor paintings, they are amazingly abstract in the sense of, if you look at, because how he started those paintings, if you sort of, if you know the process of painting, um, especially in watercolor, um, there's all kinds of splattering going on in big, broad shapes, and then he's narrowing down and then picking out bits that make reference points for, to just kind of pull out the, the landscape. He sees this big picture that he's laying down, and then um, that all serves the purpose of um, making it look, it, it's fresher, and um, then you can kind of pull away from that. So basically what I'd like to do is just recap what I just sort of said in, in the beginning, um, that my, my work is about painting, painting in the moment and reacting to the moments of, of color, light, and movement um, at the places around me. So it's basically the simple, interesting bits of color, bits of movement, bits of light that hold my interest and that's where I am going to continue like, to explore and bring in more fun stuff like maybe one around ice fishing shack or um, more figures. The figures have become interesting to me. So that's where I'm at. That's where I'm heading. So also thank you to Karen and Michael and to the staff. And also to Dan Caney who wrote the, uh, the essay that's in the catalog. He wrote an amazing essay in here, which I'm very grateful for. Um, he's an arts writer and critic. So thank you very much.